Quest Nest now has a Kickstarter for the Divine Forge, their brand new adventure path. This is an adventure for character level 6 through 9 that includes three chapters you can play together or as independent adventures. Included are plug and play locations, tailored music and dice, professional battle maps, supported by stunning artwork, unique spells, items, factions, deities, and more in this GM friendly adventure. Even the base level support provides you with a stunning range of content. Quest Nest has already proven they have quick turnaround on delivering content to supporters. Click the link I pinned in the comments to take you to the Kickstarter page. Hey Optomancers, Chris here. So recently I did some analysis of various summoning spells in D&D. I discussed some of the issues with spells like Conjure Animals and our alternatives to make an effective but also table-friendly summoning focused character in D&D. And when I was thinking about concepts that aren't table-friendly, one of the first things I thought of was the Necromancer. And part of the reason for that is that if you want to make an optimized Necromancer, the features kind of lead you to a particular type of character. And that's one that utilizes the Animate Dead spell to create armies of minions. Now, conceptually, that's really cool. If you've ever seen it in actual play, not so cool. Now, if you didn't watch my last video, I kind of cover the reasons why characters like that aren't very table friendly. And if you haven't seen it, then you really should watch that video first. It really sets the foundation for the build I'm presenting today. Look, there it is, linked for you at the top right of your screen. Click that, watch the video, and if you like what I covered, I think you'll like this build. And if you don't, then you can probably save your time for watching this video as well as my next couple. Are you enjoying this content? Would you like to support it? If you would, please click the link to my Patreon page that you'll find in the video description. My patrons see these videos early and they don't have to watch YouTube ads. Additional perks, depending on your level of support, you might be a member of my exclusive Discord community, or you might get called out in a video. Wouldn't that be a thrill? Just like these people right now. Thank you so much to Tazel, TomTom, Tom, Vu, Wesley Terpstra, Zachary Shapiro, Alex C, Hey Mr. Wonderful, Alexander Tinkoff, Arden, Babrak, Blue Wolf, Blue Eyes White Seven, Ryan Delgado, Brother Shadow, Burr, Condor, John D, Discarpus Nine, El Conquista Dorito, Eric Harvey, and Falcon Neal. Thank you all so much for your support. Let's get started. Now for me, I love the idea of a summoning character, and I've come to the conclusion that the summoning spells from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything warrant special attention. In fact, I drew the conclusion that just the spells themselves, with no special attention to our build decisions, are worthy castings. Particularly, summon Shadow Spawn, summon Fey, summon Undead, and summon Aberration. This was due to a combination of durability, reliability of damage, spell level, and quantity of damage. So once I completed that analysis, I excitedly started looking at classes and subclasses, feats and spells, to determine what build decisions we could make to enhance these spells even further. And if you know me at all, you know the first class I started looking at, the wizard. Also, probably no surprise, I took a look at conjurer first. These spells are generally Conjuration spells, and I remember that conjurers have some subclass features specifically related to summoning. Well, one feature specifically related to summoning anyways. At 14th level, a conjurer adds 30 temporary hit points to any creature they summon or create with a conjuration spell. 30 extra hit points sounds great, but 14th level doesn't sound great. At 10th level though, focus conjuration. Although not specifically related to summoning, it does help protect concentration of the conjurer while concentrating on a conjuration spell, and that would certainly apply to conjuration spells for summoning. So I was looking pretty hard on how to make a conjurer work for a summoning build, and I did note I guess the 6th level feature could probably be of some use in concert with summoning, though this is stretching a bit more. And that's about it. So working backwards from 14th level, the conjurer offers a lot, but working upwards from 1st level, uh, the features that apply to summoning, they just come pretty late in my opinion. 
and that led me to looking to other subclasses of wizard and analyzing their features. I noted an abjurer can share their arcane ward, and that could certainly be helpful. Evokers can potentially blast enemies with evocation spells while excluding their own summoned creature. But the one that ended up getting me really excited was the Necromancer, and that is partially because Necromancers, I don't see a lot of them in gameplay, and when I do, they tend to be disruptive. Because their features really do push that stereotype of hordes of animated undead, and that has lots of problems with it, which I'll cover a little later in the video. Now this might seem counterintuitive, because the entire plan of focusing on these spells was to avoid the less table-friendly summoning spells. And here we have a subclass that, I mean, when I see this played, it's about creating armies of animated undead, and that creates all kinds of problems. The strategy itself has all kinds of issues, but also it is just super disruptive to your table, and we cannot make a table-friendly necromancer build if we're going to focus on that spell. But you really do feel pressured to focus on it because of their 6th level feature, Undead Thralls. Here is a feature that adds the animate dead spell to your spellbook, provides an extra zombie or skeleton when you cast it, and provides two additional benefits to those creatures. First, it increases their maximum hit points by an amount equal to your wizard level, and second, it adds your proficiency bonus to weapon damage rolls for those creatures. But check this out. It says, whenever you create an undead using a necromancy spell, it has these additional benefits. The summon spells from Tasha's are all conjuration spells with one exception. Here is summon undead, and as we can see, it is a necromancy spell. So it is a spell that creates an undead using a necromancy spell. So by using undead thralls, we increase both the hit points and the damage of the creature we summon. The bonus to damage, by the way, is going to scale with our level, but also our spell slot level, because every additional attack from our summon undead will also benefit from this feature. So that is exponential scaling. I am adding an edit to this video, uh, because if we look at the forms we can choose with Summon Undead, here they are. Uh, so this is the stat block for Summon Undead. So we can choose, you can see, a putrid form, a ghostly form, or a skeletal form. And my original plan was to use the skeletal form and take advantage of the ranged attack that it can do. However, I noticed, once again, let's go back to Undead Thralls. You can see it says, the creature adds your proficiency bonus to its weapon damage rolls, and then... Going back to the stat block, you will see that here we've got three attacks, and we can see that two of them are weapon damage rolls, and one of them is a ranged spell attack, and that happens to be the skeletal form. So this character needs to use one of the other two forms. The putrid form does not have reliable damage, so we are going to be using the ghostly form. Now again, the original plan was to use the skeletal form, and... If you hear some point in the video me referring to the skeletal form, I will go through the video and make sure the best I can that I refer to the ghostly form, but that's why that would happen. But my intention here is to use the ghostly form. Now, because it doesn't have a range attack, it does have fly with hover, which is very useful. Uh, we can also use long strider to increase its speed as well as our help action. But what we want to do definitely is to do a ritual to cast Phantom Steed before we do the summon. Then we do the summon, and the summon can ride the Phantom Steed, and ideally, the Phantom Steed will do the disengage action, move in, get the attacks, then move away without provoking opportunity attacks to help keep that ghostly form safe, because the armor class is not that great. It's not terrible, but it's, it's not particularly strong and it doesn't have a huge amount of hit points uh, so we are going to want to keep it out of danger as much as we can but the ghostly form definitely is the way we want to go to get those bigger damage numbers now the damage is slightly different from the skeletal form and the ghostly form so I have updated all the damage calculations here so that they take the d8 into account instead of the 2d4 uh, so just wanted to let you know that as we move into the rest of this video. I should also mention that when it comes to enhancing these summoning spells, adding to the summon's damage is really rare. 
other than some really limited stuff, like, you know, you could use a bard, inspiring the summon, that kind of thing, I could only really find two features in the game that just gave a repeatable bonus to damage. And it was this one and the Oathbreaker Paladins Aura of Hate. And yes, I did consider a multi-class Necromancer Oathbreaker, but I was able to dismiss that really fast. Before getting into ability scores, which were going to be a nightmare anyways, seven levels of Paladin means slowing spell slot progression by four levels. And that's two full levels of spell slots, which means such a multi-class would be summoning undead, not just with fewer hit points, but one full attack less. Which would basically mean that even with unrealistic ability scores, Aura of Hate fails to deliver more damage if we're going Necromancer. Here is what is super cool though. I like the idea of a Dread Necromancer, but I never play them because Armies of Skeletons is fantastic thematically, but it just doesn't work. It not being table friendly is just the tip of the iceberg, but that alone is enough to prevent me from using the concept. And so I tend not to play Necromancers because what's the point if we're not making use of the one feature that makes summoning undead better? It's probably the standout feature for Necromancers as well. And here we are with our verified knowledge that summon undead is worthwhile on its own. And now we have a way to enhance that. So the Dread Necromancer is our build today. Starting with the concept for the build, our Dread Necromancer is the exact concept you're probably envisioning when you hear the title. The Dark Wizard who has learned to tap the arcane powers associated with death itself for personal power. Their magic encapsulates this theme to spread death with this necrotic power as well as force back the spirits of the dead to serve at their whim. I don't know how much more I need to describe the concept, you get it. Starting with our racial selection, we are choosing the Hobgoblin. This is the Monsters of the Multiverse version that I'm using for this build. However, this isn't the happy and helpful Hobgoblin presented in that book. This is the Hobgoblin that parents warn their children about before they go to bed. There's a couple features we get through this race that really work for this build. But without going into details on the rest of it, we're medium sized, we're a humanoid, we have 30 base movement and 60 foot dark vision. Fey Ancestry gives us advantage on saving throws made to avoid or end the charm condition. Now let's talk about the meat of the race. Those are our next two features. The first is Fey Gift. This allows the ability to provide the help action as a bonus action, a number of times equal to our proficiency bonus per long rest. We can use this to provide advantage to our summoned creature but in addition, we can provide temporary hit points to the summon and ourselves, an increase to speed to the summon and ourselves, or impose disadvantage on a creature that our summon creature hits with an attack. All three of these I think are pretty good. The second providing useful maneuverability and the first and third both providing additional protections. This is on top of the offensive boost from the help action in the first place. And since this is a bonus action, it won't interfere with us spellcasting using our action. The next feature that really works well for us is Fortune from the Many. This allows us to alter an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw we make with a plus three. I mean, technically it's up to a plus three, but it's going to be plus three. This again is usable a number of times equal to our proficiency bonus per long rest. So right off the bat, this is a great boost to protecting our concentration as we can use this to enhance our concentration saving throws. And just to be transparent, this feature isn't specifically good for necromancers. This is just a good feature. A plus three to an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw when you need it is a straight out strong feature universally. I have been planning to highlight a hobgoblin in a build ever since Monsters of the Multiverse was released, as I think this feature combined with Fey Gift is a really strong combination. So with our ability scores, first off, we're selecting the plus two slash plus one option from Hobgoblin to increase our intelligence by two and our constitution by one. With point by, we end up with a strength of eight, dexterity of 15, constitution of 16, intelligence of 17, and a wisdom and charisma of eight. So how did our character start out? Well, I see this character descending into the dark arts, you know, rather than starting out that way. So we're going to begin as a mere dabbler in magic, but our primary profession is Undertaker. No, not that Undertaker, though that might be an interesting build at some point, but I think I'm going to stick a pin in that one. So we're starting with Artificer, and we'll have proficiency in woodcarver's tools for creating elaborate vessels for the departed. As a dabbler in magic, we'll be proficient in Arcana, and we'll pick up Perception as well. 
As an artificer, we're going to have proficiency in light and medium armor, as well as shields, proficiency in simple weapons, thieves tools, tinkers tools, and constitution saving throw proficiency. So from an optimizer's viewpoint, this is the holy trinity for class tips for a wizard. Artificer rounds up their level when multi-classing with spellcasters, so we don't lose any spell slot progression. And since we're upcasting summon undead, it's just fine if we have spell slots of higher level than any spells known. Constitution saving throw proficiency improves our concentration saving throws. And medium armor and shield gets rid of that pesky low armor class that wizards otherwise would be contending with. Magical tinkering isn't powerful, but it is fun. It's more of a storytelling creativity feature than a mechanical one, allowing you to enhance devices so they shed a bit of light, create audible messages, emit sound effects or odors, or display static visual effects. Now we should talk about artificer spellcasting. It combines really well with wizard, but there is one issue with multiclassing wizard and artificer that you should at least be aware of. If an artificer casts a spell, it is automatically considered to have a material component. But more than that, we have to use our artificer focus, which is gonna be our thieves tools or artisans tools, and we must have them in our hand when we cast our spell. Now, if we are using a shield, which we will, that means you need to remember, you'll need to draw your tools to cast your artificer spells. And once we start progressing in wizard, we're not gonna to wanna to still be holding those tools at the end of our turn, or it could interfere with us casting wizard spells when it's not our turn, like spells like counterspell or shield or absorb elements. At first level, this is not a problem, but at higher levels, you need to consider that before casting any of these artificer spells. I mean, if your table worries about juggling spell components, then you need to worry about it. If they don't, then you don't. But for the most part, I'm considering that this character is probably going to be casting these spells at first level. And once we get into higher levels, we'll probably just be casting our wizard spells anyways. Uh, in fact, as we increase our intelligence, we'll get more preparations of artificer spells. And I didn't even bother selecting any additional ones because they just aren't great for us to cast. For cantrips, we have two selections. We'll take guidance. This provides a d4 to an ability check for ourselves or the creature we touch. This is a great cantrip, and it is normally not available to wizards, so it's a good option for us to pick up here. Now, just for first level, we will want an attack cantrip. Now, because of the requirements for casting, this probably isn't going to be something we use past level 1. But at level 1, we want something to do on our turn. I'm recommending Magic Stone because, you know, Magic Stone is actually going to outdamage any of the other attack cantrips at first level since you add your intelligence bonus to the damage roll. And that gives us a 6.5 average damage result, which will be higher than any other attack cantrip. Uh, but now I have to discuss juggling what's in our hand anyways. So if you don't worry about components at your table, ignore this part of the video. But I do want to explain how this spell works by the rules. Just be aware that if you are wearing a shield, then you have one free hand. You have to hold your tools in your hand when you cast this spell, meaning you don't have a free hand to throw a stone. Maybe you can drop the tools and then throw the stone, or maybe you can cast this over and over so that you already have three stones when combat begins. If at your table you can't utilize either of these options, then maybe go ahead and grab Firebolt. But assuming you can, Magic Stone is the better option. Okay, and for our first level spells, we want to start with at least one spell that's strong to cast in combat at level one, even if we don't cast it at higher levels. And then we probably want a couple spells that continue to be useful for us at higher levels. And because of artificial component stuff, then we're looking for things that ideally we can cast outside of combat. So our big first level spell will be Fairy Fire. This is a 20 foot cube area of effect spell and all creatures within the cube make a dexterity saving throw. If they fail, they shed dim light in a 10-foot radius, they can't benefit from being invisible, and most importantly, attacks against them have advantage as long as we maintain our concentration. This ends up being a buff for all attackers in your party, and it's a pretty strong option as far as first level spells go. For other two spell options, I really like Long Strider. This is a nice buff, lasts a long time, and it doesn't use our concentration. It adds a 10 feet movement bonus, regardless of the movement type we're using, and it has a great upcast option. 
Now, being that I've made some changes with this build so that it's going to be using the ghostly form, long strider is even more important. Long strider adds to your fly speeds as well as your land speed. So for our ghostly form that has a 40 foot hover speed, long strider is going to increase that to 50 feet with a first level spell. That is just a no brainer. We will absolutely cast long strider on our summon just as an automatic thing. We're also going to pick up Disguise Self. Now, this is a utility option, but it has a good duration. It's definitely an out-of-combat spell. It continues to be useful at higher levels, and perhaps especially for that dreaded necromancer that wants to infiltrate those simple town folk who cringe at terror at the sight of our character. So level one, it's pretty easy. We're going to have scale mail. We'll grab a shield when we can. I mean, eventually we'll upgrade to half plate, but you're probably not doing that at level one. So we're looking at an 18 armor class, and in combat, you're going to use Magic Stone. And if it's a tough combat, you'll throw a Fairy Fire on round one. So it, it pretty straightforward. Now at second level, we're going to begin to access the Dark Arts as we multi-class into Wizard. Now we're a fair bit into the video already, and I really want to get to the summoning. Though I think most viewers are probably aware that Wizards do just fine before seventh level. But thematically, when this particular build goes from Wizard to a Dread Necromancer is level 7. Level 1 Artificer, level 6 Wizard. So I'm going to quickly go over everything from levels 2 through 7. Let's first go through our class and subclass features, and then through the spells we add to our spellbook. Hit points are on the low end of the spectrum, but because we did start with a high constitution score, overall our hit points are going to be fine. Wizard spellcasting is powerful and unique. First, we can prepare different spells from our spellbook after any long rest, and after Tasha's optional class features, we can change cantrip selections as well. Wizards get the very nice option to cast rituals from their spellbook without preparing them, so we're going to select a fair number of rituals. We should keep in mind though, although we can cast ritual spells without using spell slots, any spell that you cast that uses more than an action to cast will use our concentration. So if we are concentrating on our summon spell, that's not the time to cast a ritual. Wizards can recover spell slots after a short rest once per long rest. The spell slot recovery is equal to half our level in wizard rounded up. So at 7th level, we'll be a 6th level wizard, so we could recover 3 spell slot levels. Obviously, we're selecting Necromancy as our arcane tradition, so let's quickly review those features. So, Necromancy Savant, you gain the ability to copy Necromancy spells more quickly. This is really a ribbon feature, it is not worth spending a lot of time on. Grim Harvest is a little more substantial. It's gained at second level. Once per turn, when we kill one or more creatures with spells of first level or higher, we recover hit points equal to twice the spell's level, and three times if the spell is a necromancy spell. Now, ideally, we're not going to be wounded a lot of the time, so I don't expect this to be a very big deal. This is not one of the more powerful wizard second level features. But one thing we should actually discuss here, because this is obviously relevant to the build, is... Does a creature killed by a creature we summoned satisfy the requirements of Grim Harvest? So in other words, if we cast Summon Undead, that Summon Undead kills something, do we recover hit points? Jeremy Crawford's answered this question multiple times, uh, but I'll highlight one of those responses because this answer doesn't just apply to the Animate Dead spell, which obviously tends to be the subject of this question, but his reply here definitely applies to Summon Undead as well. When you summon, create, or animate a creature, that creature is a spell effect, but it is not a spell. So that means in order for us to benefit from Grim Harvest, we need to inflict the damage that kills the creature ourselves. Meaning spells that deliver damage directly have a bit more value, though I think optimally we shouldn't overvalue Grim Harvest. It's a nice little benefit when it comes up, but I wouldn't be making build decisions chasing this small bit of hit point recovery. However, one thing we will be interested in are spells that deliver damage, because we are a damage delivering concept. And honestly, a lot of the spells that deliver damage are the ones that don't use our concentration, and we'll be looking for spells like that as well. So it just so happens we will be selecting lots of spells that will benefit from Grim Harvest. But that's not why we're selecting those spells. At level 4 in Wizard gets us our first ability score increase, and we will take Telekinetic, so first off, obviously, we'll take the plus one intelligence to boost our intelligence to 18. I'm recommending Telekinetic over a feat like, say, Fey Touched, because this character doesn't really have a requirement for their bonus action. I mean, they can deliver the help action a few times as their bonus action, but other than that, their bonus action will normally be free. 
So this feat gives a great built-in bonus action option, and that's why I think it's optimal here. Now, I've already covered Undead Thralls, but I actually want to take a little bit more time to discuss the most obvious use of this feature. So we'll be using the feature to boost the Summon Undead spell, but the obvious initial intent of this feature centers around the Animate Dead spell. So we should at least take a look at that spell. This spell has all the undesirable features I brought up in my last video. The whole idea behind the Dread Necromancer is to make a character that's table friendly, which the Necromancer that focuses on this spell has never been. That's why you don't see a lot of them. And it really comes down to the usual suspects. Multiple spots on the initiative order bog down gameplay. Having several creatures added that all take their own turns slows down gameplay far more. The power of creating many, many creatures with this spell is super swingy. It can do a crap ton of damage. It also can do none and face the danger of being wiped out with a single area of effect spell. Nevertheless, Animate Dead, particularly enhanced by the Undead Thralls feature, is a powerful spell, but it is not table friendly, in the least. The build I'm presenting today is intended to be optimal, but it is also intended to be fun to play, fun for your DM, and fun for the other players. So we're not gonna use this spell. So let's talk about the spells we do take. Our character level is 7, but our wizard level is 6. This means we'll have 4 wizard cantrips and 4 first level slots, 3 second level slots, 3 third level slots, and 1 fourth level slot. Now we have no fourth level spells, but we'll be using the slot to upcast summon undead. With a 1 hour duration, we should be able to get multiple combats out of this spell. And it might very well last us until our next short rest. So we're going to take 4 wizard cantrips. The first one I'll take is chill touch. I think it's the most thematically appropriate cantrip. We get a d8 scaling necrotic damage with a strong 120 foot range. When we hit a target that can't recover hit points until the start of our next turn, and if we hit an undead target, it has disadvantage on attack rolls against us until the end of our next turn. But be aware that although necrotic damage is pretty reliable normally, it's not particularly reliable against undead creatures. There's five pages on D&D Beyond of creatures immune to necrotic damage, and three pages of those are undead creatures that are immune to necrotic damage. However, the most useful part of this cantrip actually isn't even the damage. It's the inability of creatures to recover hit points. This doesn't just stop healing spells, this also stops regeneration. And by rules as written, this is crazy, it even stops the mythic trait. Which, if you are fighting a mythic creature, is insane. And DMs, you probably want to consider if you even want to run this as written against those kinds of creatures. Because it single-handedly kind of ruins the whole idea of a mythic creature. And that's pretty strong for a cantrip. We're going to take Firebolt here for two reasons. First, it can target objects, which can be super useful. The more experience I have with this cantrip, the more I'm convinced that the ability to target objects is potentially the best additional feature that any attack cantrip has. Secondly, it provides us an alternate damage type. Mind Sliver gives us yet another damage type, but it also avoids the attack roll, requiring the normally weak intelligence saving throw instead. This also imposes a d4 penalty on the target's next saving throw before the end of our next turn, so it can be a reasonable lead up to an important saving throw. Then Minor Illusion is one of the only illusion spells that requires no concentration, so we can use this to do things like provide obscurement to our summon. Now I'll mention once again that I expect this character is going to be concentrating on summon undead a lot, and in some cases perhaps in every combat. So I was particularly attracted to spells that didn't require concentration. So this list is weighted towards non-concentration spells. Absorb elements will keep this prepared for a reaction to gain resistance to elemental damage. Comprehend languages. It's a ritual, so we won't need to prepare it. And it has useful utility. Detect magic. Same thing. Don't need to prepare and useful utility. Find familiar is arguably the best first level spell in the game and only on the wizard spell list. Alarm. Again, the ritual tag makes this an attractive option. Shield, because of course we have to take the shield spell. And we're going to add sleep. Now we're only going to prepare this when we're second level. And I wouldn't bother preparing it at higher levels, but it's worth a spot in our spell book just for that level too. Unseen Servant finishes off our first level spells 
and five of our eight first level spells don't need preparation and we'll keep shield and absorb elements prepared forever. For second level spells, we'll take web. This is one of our primary options when we don't have our undead summoned. Very strong spell for control. Probably the best second level spell available to wizards. I mean, it might be the best second level spell, period. It also really pairs nicely with our telekinetic feat, which we can use to pull or push creatures into the web. Tasha's Mind Whip is a good spell to do a bit of damage and debuff an enemy. It also upcasts really well and doesn't use their concentration. This is a way we could help keep summoned undead safe as well. If it ends up in a bad spot, we could do a Mind Whip, and that could allow the undead to back away from an enemy without provoking opportunity attacks, and that enemy might not have many options left when their turn comes up. Misty Step, of course, is on our list. I think that having at least some kind of bonus action teleport is practically an automatic pick when it's available. If you cast Misty Step, just be aware that any other spell you cast on that turn must be a cantrip. Mirror Image is a pretty potent defensive spell that doesn't use concentration. It has a short duration, so really a single combat kind of spell. For third level spells, let's start with the most obvious one, Summon Undead. Now Animate Dead is automatically appearing in our spellbook with Undead Thralls, but we're not going to be preparing it. And Fireball. Fireball is a great use of our third level slots while we're concentrating on Summon Undead. It has a big area of effect damage with great range and it isn't using our concentration. And you know, I guess we'll heal 6 hit points if a creature dies from our fireballs. Being that we're a dread necromancer, of course, this isn't the standard orange flame explosion. These will be sickly green flames befitting the dread necromancer. So I want to do like a snapshot of our damage at this level. This is going to assume two things. First, that we're using the Summon Undead spell. So I need to add a little bit more here because we are using the ghostly form instead of the skeletal form as I originally planned. Now this skeletal form, the whole idea of that was it's just damage. So it fires, does a lot of damage from a good range. And so ideally it can just stay out of the fight or out of danger and snipe enemies. With the ghostly form, we're gonna have to get in there. Now, if we're fighting on the ground, the ghostly form could use a phantom steed to probably go in and then get out again. But if we're fighting flying enemies, that won't be a possibility. It is going to have to fly and move up to those enemies. So what can we do to keep this thing alive? Well, first, it does have more hit points than the skeletal form. It has a base 30 hit points instead of 20. So that's 10 extra hit points. It's 40 hit points once we cast this with a fourth level spell. And then we're adding our necromancer level to its hit points as well. Uh, so we're talking about 46 hit points and we have that fly speed with hover and it's 40 feet. We'll be using long strider. So it'll be 50 feet. We have incorporeal passage and this will allow our ghost to like move through walls or ceilings or floors. Ideally they could maybe move somewhere so that they can't be attacked. However, here's the biggest thing of all. So deathly touch has a rider and the rider is very good. So we can see here, it does a D8 plus three, plus the spells level necrotic damage. And again, plus our proficiency bonus because we have undead thralls. And the creature must succeed on a wisdom saving throw against our spell DC or be frightened of the undead until the end of the target's next turn. Now, this might be the best defensive feature that the ghostly form actually has because this isn't once per turn. This is on every single attack. So if the ghostly form moves up to an enemy and attacks twice, if they hit twice, that creature actually has to make two saving throws to avoid being frightened. And if it is frightened of the ghost, then it will have disadvantage on attacks. And disadvantage on attacks against our ghost is going to help protect it. And it is even possible that if we split up our attacks, we might even frighten more than one enemy. And I think we actually have to lean into that a little bit. Now, when we get to higher levels, Immunity to Frightened Condition is not all that uncommon. And when that's the case, then we're going to have to rely on Incorporal Passage or our Phantom Steed to try to keep the ghost safe. But if we land the Frightened Condition, then we don't really have to worry too much about that creature because it will be attacking with disadvantage. And although our armor class isn't all that high, you add disadvantage on the attack roll, and that is going to add a lot of durability to our summoned creature. 
So at level 7, my baseline for damage is 17.7. .7. That's how much damage we would expect if we were playing a Warlock, throwing Eldritch Blast with Agonizing Blast, and concentrating on the Hex spell. So let's see how we compare. Now, I'm assuming you watched my previous video where I showed that we can deliver 20% over the baseline at level 8. Now, I'm expecting a better result here. I'm going to assume that Chill Touch is our cantrip, but if we do use Firebolt, the numbers do go up a little bit. Okay, so our damage calculations at level 7. So we have 14.5 base damage on attacks from the ghostly form. That's a d8 plus 3 plus 4 from the spell slot level plus 3 from our proficiency bonus. 60% chance to hit, uh, and that gives us 8.7 average damage on each attack. We have two attacks, so that's 17.4. We're going to add a little bit because we might critical hit, so that's a 5% times an average increase to damage of 9, and that's 4.5 times two different attacks, so that's 0 0.45. Then we're going to cast our Chill Touch, and I've used 0 0.65 here because the entire damage doubles on a critical hit, so we can just add the 5% and do it as a single calculation, times 9 average damage is 5.85. And what that gives us is a total DPR of 23.7. The baseline at this level is 17.7. .7. That's 34% over the baseline at level 7. Now, remember, if we were just doing this unenhanced, we would be looking at about 20%. So we've gone from 20% to 34%, by choosing Necromancer. Now, if damage was all we were doing and Chill Touch was all we were casting, this on its own is okay. However, we are going to be using other spell slots for Tasha's Mind Whip, Fireball. This is going to increase our damage and provide other helpful effects. So I think this concept is working well at this level. So we're gonna add some levels and we'll take another look at our damage at level 13. So at level 8 in Wizard, we'll increase our Intelligence score to 20. This improves our spell DCs, our spell attack rolls, and improves our summon creature as well. At 10th level, we get Inured to Death. Beginning at 10th level, you have Resistance to Necrotic Damage. That's good. And your hit point maximum can't be reduced. That's pretty situational. Very useful when it does come up, but I wouldn't expect that to come up a lot. Uh, so overall, I'd say a not bad feature. At level 12, we're going to take the Resilient Dexterity feat. This provides us proficiency in two of the three big saving throws. Now, we could go with Resilient Wisdom instead, and I did consider that. And if you wanted to play this build and you felt that Wisdom was the more important saving throw, then go ahead and select that. I went with Dexterity here mainly because it also improves our initiative. And when we improve our initiative, we also improve the initiative of our summon creature. Our spell slots now include a 6th and 7th level slot, so the 6th level slot probably gives us the biggest bang for our buck on Summon Undead. But, you know, at this point, I would probably use that 7th level slot for Summon Undead as well. This should give us the 3 attack creature for pretty much any combat in a day. And we don't have 7th level spells anyways yet, so we might as well upcast a good spell with it. We're going to add one more cantrip, and we'll add Mage Hand. Now, we get Mage Hand automatically with the Telekinetic feat, but if we take the cantrip, it actually adds 30 feet to our range, so now we have a 60-foot range Mage Hand. We will add Counterspell to our third level spells, and of course we will prepare it. Counterspell just gets more and more important as we increase in levels. It is also something we can cast without interrupting our concentration. I took Phantom Steed. Uh, now, you should be aware that you can't cast a ritual after summoning the undead creature because casting any spell that requires more than an action to cast will interrupt concentration. But you could do the Phantom Steed first and then cast Summon Undead. And the idea would be you could put your summon creature on the steed and that would provide it even more protection just by adding all that superior mobility to it. I will be adding life transference to this character, and this is a change since I decided to use the ghostly form. I figured we might actually need some healing. So life transference, what it does is it take you take 48 damage when you cast it, and the creature that you choose receives double that amount in healing. So we could do that to give our ghostly form on average about 36 points with a single action and a single third level spell. That's a fair amount of healing. The issue is, of course, we would have to make a concentration save because we took damage. But 
the DC of that concentration save is likely going to be 10. The average amount of damage we would take is 18, you half that, that's 9. The minimum amount is 10, so we actually have to roll really high for it to be more than 10. And with a proficiency bonus of plus 4 and a constitution bonus of plus 3, we have a plus 7 on our save already. If we roll a 1, we would get an 8. If we roll a 2, we would get a 9. Those two results could potentially cause a failure to a concentration. But here's where it's a really good thing that we chose Hobgoblin because we can add plus 3. So if we add plus 3, even a 1, we should be able to make our concentration save. So life transference should be a safe cast as long as we have enough hit points ourselves to get our summoned undead back into fighting shape if they've taken a lot of damage. We're going to grab Dimension Door, super useful, and it allows you to teleport yourself as well as your minion and without requiring line of sight. After a bit of thought, I decided I would take Summon Aberration as well. Now, this is not enhanced by our Undead Thralls feature, but we already know it can deliver effective damage even without that. The idea here is to have like a backup. So if we expect a lot of necrotic resistance and immunity, because we're entering an area where we expect there to be a lot of those kinds of creatures, then Summon Aberration might be a good backup. Now, I almost never take this spell, Blight, but listen, it is an option against single enemies, especially if the area of effect of a fireball or the fire damage type might be a problem. I guess technically we do recover 12 hit points if we kill a creature with this. I mean, this pick is iffy. Expect this spell to deliver about... Uh, 27 damage after we take saving throws into account unless you're fighting a plant creature if you're fighting a plant creature then this spell is fantastic with fifth level spells we'll grab transmute rock this is in my opinion the best non-concentration spell at fifth level this provides really good control and non-concentration control options are few and far between you know i'm still going to take wall of force there's going to be times when we're not concentrating already, and Wall of Force is probably the single most potent 5th level spell, period. Steel Wind Strike, I think, gives us a pretty good damage option. The damage here is pretty good, and it has the added benefit of not having friendly fire. The damage type is one of the most reliable in the game as well. Rory's Telepathic Bond is a good ritual. Again, cast this before Summon Undead. Spells like this are a good way to keep limited preparations in check. For 6th level spells, we'll grab Magic Jar. This is a fun necromancy spell, very powerful and very thematic for this character. It takes way too long to explain how it works, so I will link my video for Magic Jar up above. We're also going to grab Mass Suggestion. Now, I should mention that I said we would likely use our 6th and 7th level slots on Summon Undead at this point, but, you know, we're not going to be 13th level forever. And as higher level slots become available for Summon Undead, those 6th and 7th level slots are eventually going to be opened up. So let's run through our damage at 13th level. Baseline at this level is up to 26.55, and considering our calculations in our last video, we should expect our character to be improving their damage versus the baseline as we scale up Summon Undead. I was really pleased to see that, that the more we scale Summon Undead, the better it does even against a scaling baseline. With these calculations, I'm assuming we're using our 6th level spell slot, the damage here is a, you know, a wee bit higher if we cast with our 7th level slot, but it's still pretty close. So here is our level 13 damage, so we have 18.5 base damage on the Ghostly Forms attacks. That's a d8 plus 3 plus 6 from the spell level plus 5 from proficiency bonus. That is 60% chance to hit times 18.5 is 11.1, .1, and we have 3 attacks. That's an average damage of 33.3. .3. Also, we should expect to hit with probably two of the three attacks. That is two saving throws against the Frightened Condition for the creature. And yeah, some creatures at this level are going to have Legendary Resistance. They just can't afford to be expending Legendary Resistance on a one-turn Frightened effect, or their Legendary Resistances are going to be gone really, really fast. Uh, I mean, if they do, great. But there is really good chance at this point we're going to frighten any creature that's not immune already. Then we're going to add another 0.68 from Critical Hits and 8.78 from our Chill Touch. And that gives us a total DPR of 42.76 against the baseline of 26.6. I said the damage would go up, and boy, it sure did. We're at 61% over baseline. Now, this is the kind of damage number where it doesn't even matter 
that we have all these other spells and potentially delivering the Frightened Condition, this is actually pretty good damage on its own. Uh, I mean, there are builds that do more damage than this, but as far as optimized damage builds go, anything over 50% I consider to be pretty good. So by this level, we are really delivering damage now in addition to all those other things that we can do. So uh, I would say that this build has gotten significantly stronger even for its level at level 13 versus level 7. And this is just upscaling a third level spell. So our next snapshot is going to be at 17th level overall, and that's going to be kind of our final damage numbers because that is basically as much damage as we're going to deliver. It's also the last time that the baseline scales. So what you see at 17th level is what you're going to see at 20th level. Now the unfortunate thing about 17th level on this character is we have a 9th level spell slot and we have no 9th level spells. Yeah, we'll probably use it to upcast some undead, but I'm not going to disingenuously claim that we wouldn't be better off using a 9th level slot for a 9th level spell if we had one. And at 18th level, when we do get 9th level spells, don't use your 9th level slot to upcast summon undead. At 14th level in wizard, we get the command undead subclass feature. If you can land this, it can be a pretty nuts feature. So if you do fight, like say a lich or really powerful undead, and you do happen to burn through their legendary resistances, then I mean, get together with the rest of the party. Get your eloquence bar to lower their save, get a mind sliver set up, get the clockwork soul sorcerer to cancel the advantage, you know, whatever you can do, because having a pet lich is going to be something everyone in your party can get behind. With our next ability score increase, we take the alert feat. Again, remember, it's not just our initiative we're rolling. And immune to surprise is really handy to have. Added to our spell book is Scatter, a great non-concentration spell allowing you to reset the chessboard in your favor. Soul Cage, this is a fun spell, and it is non-concentration, it is super thematic for our character, and it doesn't eat up our actions. You know, I had forgotten that etherealness is non-concentration, single action casting, meaning it's actually not a bad spell for us to cast while we're concentrating on another spell. I mean, at this level, this might actually be a worthy upcast for a ninth level slot, because we could turn the whole party, including our undead spirit, ethereal when we needed to. Now, I won't keep teleport prepared, but in a campaign, this is a huge spell to have. I mean, if Gandalf had teleported in his spell book, Lord of the Rings would have been a very short book. Finger of Death heals us 21 hit points if it slays the target, and we'll get a zombie, I guess. Basically, if we want single target damage spells, don't take Disintegrate, because that does no damage if the target makes their saving throw. Finger of Death at least still delivers a somewhat respectable 31 damage to the creature if they make their saving throw, and it does over 60 damage if they don't. Now, Force Cage, I think, is an obvious pick. No concentration and lasts an hour. Now, remember, we can't really afford our 8th or 9th level spell slots for 8th level spells, so I'm recommending Clone, which is a good out-of-combat spell. I can give the whole party, if you like, some backups if they're slain. Demiplane, again, is a good spell to have, even if you aren't adventuring, just to keep all your stuff. If you kill a lot of creatures with your Finger of Death, you could store all your zombies in here as well. But just take it from me. If you were to, you know, actually use this that way, and you flood the battlefield with an army of zombies, that is something that's going to be cooler in your head than how it actually plays out at the table. We'll be taking two more 8th level spells, so Antipathy, Sympathy, and Telepathy are added to our spell list, mainly for utility and off-time castings. I didn't prepare either of them. So here are our spell slots at 17th level, and you can see, of course, we don't have any 9th level spells, so we'll use that 9th level slot for Summon Undead. We'll also use our 8th level slot for Summon Undead. That might get us through the whole day. And if that's the case, you're going to see we have lots and lots of spell slots left. Now, I've highlighted my 3rd, 4th, and 5th level slots because remember that when we take a short rest, we can recover spell slots. 8 levels of spell slots, in fact, but none above 5th level. So we're going to have a lot of spells in that kind of range. And if we want to focus on damage, then we really should consider maybe not doing a cantrip every round. Uh, what's the point of being a 17th level character and not casting leveled spells when you have so many? 
Now, we're going to want to save some third level slots in case we need some like a counter spell. But for the most part, we can pretty much throw these spells with Abandon in combat. So we could still do Chill Touch, and I will just tell you right now that we end up with a little over 80% over baseline, which is better than we saw at 13th level, and it's good damage. But I just don't think it's realistic that we're going to be playing a 17th level character, and every round we're going to throw a cantrip. But it is difficult when you start looking at area of effect spells or multiple target spells because when you split the damage, that is not the same as single target damage. Tactically, it is so different that it's not really comparable. But what if we just look at single target damage? Like, let's say with our third level spells, we throw a fireball just at that one guy. And at fourth level spells, we throw that blight spell that I normally never take. And with fifth level spells, maybe we upcast that blight spell. Well, Blight does 8d8, and then they save for half. Let's say they save half the time. So 8 times 4.5, which is the average of a d8, and then we multiply by 0.75 to take into account saving throws. And if we throw a 4th level slot and we cast Blight, we should expect about 27 points of damage. Now, if we upcast that, it becomes 9 dice. So then we would have 40.5, again, multiply by 0.75, and then we're looking at about 30 points of damage. And then Fireball does an average 28 damage times 0.75. And then we have 21 damage. So we have 21 if we use a third level slot. Or 27 on average with a fourth level slot. Or 30 on average with a fifth level slot. Divided by 3. Means on average we should be able to get about 26 points of extra damage with our action. So for these calculations... Let's skip the Chill Touch, and let's just go ahead and cast a spell that's going to deliver some damage, and our action is going to add 26 points. So, our 17th level Dread Necromancer now has a plus 6 proficiency bonus. We will be using an 8th level slot on Summon Undead. Of course, sometimes we'll use a 9th level slot, which will do a little more damage, but not enough more that it's worth a separate calculation. And they will be using their action to cast a spell that delivers damage. Um, our base spell would probably be the Blight spell, which, of course, is super thematic. So let's say Blight, even though sometimes it'll be a fireball. So our damage calculations at level 17. So our base damage is a D8 plus 3 plus 8 from the spell level plus 6 from our proficiency bonus. That's 21.5 per attack from the ghostly form. 60% chance to hit times 21.5 is 12.9. And there's four attacks, so that's a total of 51.6. Then we add, and I didn't put all the calculations here, but it's 0 0.9 is added for critical hits. And then we talked about doing Blight or another spell for another 26 points of damage. So what that ends up being is a DPR of 78.5 against the baseline of 35.4. This is 122% over the baseline. Now, I should tell you right now that I have done all kinds of martial builds on this channel that are just delivering damage. And if I get over 100% of the baseline, I am super thrilled. And I'm more than proud to present that as an optimized damage build. Here we have a character that has full spell casting. And they're doing over 100% of the damage. Now we have to wait a long time to get there. It builds and builds and builds. But the end result here is fantastic. And considering that we're just upscaling a low-level spell. That is crazy damage. Furthermore, remember that with four attacks, we're probably hitting three times. That's three saving throws to avoid the Frightened Condition. And I should also mention that if a creature has magic resistance, which a lot of them do, it's not going to apply. And why is it not going to apply? Well, I'll refer you back to that Jeremy Crawford tweet I showed at the beginning of this video. A... Creature summoned by a spell is not a spell. It's just the effect of the spell, and its attacks are its own. That's why they're not automatically treated as magical attacks. The exact same reasoning means that its fear effect is not a spell effect either. That means that magic resistance is not going to give them advantage to avoid being frightened. Three saving throws on average, could be four, might be two, and that means that creatures are almost automatically going to be frightened by this unless they happen to be immune to being frightened. So that on top of the 122% over baseline, this character, I am just thrilled with how it's turned out. 
And we could increase our damage even further if we want to dip into those super high level slots, but it would just be for like a round. Like if you want to Nova, you could do a finger of death or something. That said, we should discuss where we go from 17th level. So we're going to cast Misty Step and Shield at will. Now I really kind of thought about what we would get for our final ability score increase. I decided on Medium Armor Master. I think Lucky works here okay. But you know, Medium Armor Master, I thought, you know, this character is proficient in stealth. And this would prevent that disadvantage. And it would increase our armor class by one because we do have that 16 dexterity. We're adding a number of spells to our spell book. Not all of them ninth level spells. So we're going to add Augury for a useful ritual cast. We're also going to add Divination. Same thing. And our ninth level spells. We have Meteor Swarm, Prismatic Wall, True Polymorph, and Wish. I could go through these spells individually, but it would take a lot of time. Listen, they're ninth level spells. They're all really powerful. Now that we have ninth level spells, use your ninth level slot to cast one of these spells. So that is the Dread Necromancer, a table friendly necromancy build. And I honestly kind of question like, if you look online for recommendations for optimized necromancers, are you going to find a single one other than this that's actually table friendly? I don't think so. I think they pretty much universally lean hard into doing as much with animate dead as they can, despite the fact that that's not table friendly. And here's a dirty secret from somebody who does that kind of content. I make a lot of character builds on this channel. Obviously, I don't play them all. There's no way I could do that. Uh, because even though I play multiple times a week, I just don't play enough D&D to play a hundred builds. And when you do something like the Necromancer, well, what you want to do is you look at their features. How can I make the best use of these to get the most out of them? And then you look at Undead Thralls and it leads you to Animate Dead, obviously. So you make that build, you present it online, but I don't play that build. I look at that build and go, I don't really want to play that. And you know what? All the other places online where you see that build posted, I bet you they don't play it either. This is a build that I have already set up to play next week. In fact, by the time you see this video, I'll have already played it because this is the kind of character that is fun to play as well as being optimized. So when I make a build like this, I want to do it. And I think if you want this theme, the Dread Necromancer, this is the kind of build that you should create for your table. I think you will find it far more fun than leaning hard into the animate dead. So I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments down below, though, if you've had experience with the Dread Necromancer that just totally leans into Animate Dead and how that went at your table. Otherwise, until next time, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody, and I will talk to you soon.